In my previous presentation on the Henriot HD2, I implied an intent to cover naval aviation of World War I in more detail. In the mini-documentary about the short 184, I stated that I wanted to expand on it to include stories in which it played an important role. This is the first of those. HMS Engadine was a British seaplane tender that saw service with the Royal Navy from September of 1914 to December of 1919. Seaplane tenders, also known as seaplane carriers, were an early form of aircraft carrier whose purpose was the operation of seaplanes. They represent an early means of operating aircraft at sea. Unlike the later carriers that operated aircraft from the deck, seaplane tenders would lower their aircraft to the sea via a crane. Having performed whatever operation that was intended, they were recovered by lifting them from the ocean's surface. Common to most early tenders, which were modified from other vessels, was the hangar on the aft deck, which gives such ships a distinctive and easily recognisable profile. The steamship Engadine was laid down in 1910 by William Denny and Brothers at their Dumbarton, Scotland shipyards as a fast packet for the South East and Chatham Railway Company. It was launched on September 23, 1911, and completed later that year. She operated across the English Channel on the Folkestone to Bologna run until the outbreak of World War I. She was named for the Anjardin Valley, a rather picturesque location high in the Swiss Alps in the canton of Graubünden. In August of 1914, the SS Anjardine was requisitioned by the Royal Navy, and rather hastily refitted as a seaplane carrier, being commissioned into service the following month. The Royal Navy's first purpose-built seaplane carrier, HMS Ark Royal, had revealed a distinct lack of the speed required to operate with the Grand Fleet, achieving only 11 knots. So the RN looked around for something better, and settled on packet ships and fast freighters as being suitable for acquisition and conversion, their top speeds being significantly better than the Ark Royal. These conversions typically had top speeds of 19 to 24 knots. Initially, the Engadine was fitted with two canvas hangars, one forward and two aft, capable of carrying three seaplanes. Two derricks were installed to raise and lower the aircraft. The work was performed by Chatham Dockyard. She was assigned to the Harwich Force, along with the seaplane tenders Empress and Riviera. The three could almost be mistaken for sister ships, which is not too surprising as they were of similar size, originally manufactured by William Denny and Brothers, and also operated by the South East and Chatham Railway Company for the same purpose. All three were requisitioned by the Royal Navy in August of 1914, and so a clear intent is evident. The attached picture is actually of the HMS Riviera after its first modification, along the lines of the Engadines. All three saw early operational service as part of the Cookshaven raid on Christmas Day 1914. Reported in the London Gazette on 19th of February 1915, it was described as an air reconnaissance of the Heligoland Bight, including Cookshaven, Heligoland and Wilhelmshaven, by naval seaplanes, during which the opportunity was taken of attacking with bombs points of military importance in northern Imperial Germany. As a summary, that's actually pretty reasonable. The raid caused minimal damage and can hardly be described as a success, except in terms of demonstrating the viability of such an operation. The January 1st issue of Flight magazine states that the Cookshaven raid marks the first employment of the seaplanes of the Naval Air Service in an attack on the enemy's harbours from the sea, and apart altogether from the results achieved, is an occasion of historical moment. Not only so, but for the first time in history, a naval attack has been delivered simultaneously, above, on, and from below the surface of the water. The Engadine was purchased by the Admiralty in February of 1915 and sent to Liverpool, where Cunard made more permanent modifications to make her better suited for the role in which she had demonstrated distinct competence. 
The canvas hangers were replaced by a single, larger, more substantial unit on the rear superstructure, capable of housing four aircraft. Cranes were fitted to the rear for their handling. Armament was included in the form of four quick-firing 12-pounder guns of approximately 76mm calibre and two 3-pounder, or 47mm, Vickers anti-aircraft guns. She also carried a pigeon loft that housed carrier pigeons to be used by her aircraft if their wireless was broken. In terms of general characteristics, HMS Engadine was 323 feet long with a beam of 41 feet. Her draft was 13 feet 8 inches. Six water tube boilers powered three shafts and three steam turbines that could propel her at up to 21.5 knots, twice the speed of HMS Ark Royal. She was coal-powered and carried 400 tons, sufficient to steam 1,250 nautical miles at a speed of 15 knots. Not what you would call stellar range, but enough for her previous job and for operations in the North Sea. Her deep load displacement was 2,590 tons. Her crew complement was 197 officers and men. Following completion of the conversion, she rejoined the Harwich force in March, and on the 3rd of July she was deployed to reconnoitre the River Ems in northwestern Germany, but was unsuccessful when two of her Sopwith Schneider float planes were wrecked on takeoff and a third was badly damaged. This was probably due to unsuitable water conditions. In October, she was transferred to Vice Admiral Sir David Beatty's battle cruiser feat in Rosyth, where she engaged in trials to investigate the high-speed towing of kite balloons for artillery spotting, though her primary role was as the base ship for the fleet's seaplanes. On May 30, 1916, Engadine was attached to the 3rd Light Cruiser Squadron, commanded by Rear Admiral Trevelyan Napier, carrying two short 184s and two Sopwith Baby floatplanes. The 184s were equipped with low-power wireless radios and intended for reconnaissance and artillery observations, while the Sopwith Babies were rather optimistically intended for shooting down Zeppelins. That evening, the British Grand Fleet put to sea from its bases at Scarpa Flow, the Cromarty Firth and Rosyth, having been informed that the German High Seas Fleet was about to head into the North Sea. This, of course, were actions that led to the Battle of Jutland. HMS Engadine was actually leading the battle cruisers the following day to make use of the smooth water ahead of the fleet, the turbulent wake that trailed the ships being unsuitable for seaplane operations. At 14.20 hours on May 31st, the light cruiser HMS Galatea made the classic signal, Enemy in Sight, and at 14.40, Admiral Beatty ordered Engadine to send a seaplane to scout to the north-northeast. Within half an hour of the signal, one of the shorts was airborne with Lieutenant Frederick Joseph Rutland as a pilot and Assistant Paymaster George Stanley Truin as an observer. At 15.07, Truin radioed that they had spotted three German light cruisers and five destroyers, and in the process this became the first time that a heavier-than-aircraft had carried out a reconnaissance of an enemy fleet in action. I do not propose to cover the entirety of the battle. That's a subject beyond the scope of this channel, and besides, it has been covered more than adequately elsewhere. I particularly recommend Drakenefel's series on the subject link below. Engadine's involvement was not limited to reconnaissance. By 1830 hours, the 14,000-ton armoured cruiser HMS Warrior had taken multiple hits and been crippled. Engadine took the much larger vessel under tow, but the following morning Warrior's flooding became unsustainable and the crew were ordered to abandon ship. Engadine came alongside at 0800 and took off 675 officers and men, which necessitated their quick distribution around the ship to prevent her capsizing. The only damage she took during the battle was caused by the rolling warrior when one of her guns, presumably a barbette installation, punctured the hull below the waterline, but fortunately this was quickly patched. Engadine remained with the battlecruiser force until early 1918 when she was transferred to the Mediterranean. 
Based out of Malta, she engaged in anti-submarine patrols for the remainder of the war. In December of 1919, she ended her Royal Naval Service and was sold back to her previous owners, the Southeastern and Chatham Railway, resuming her role as a cross-channel ferry, presumably with her hangar and armament removed, as this might have proved disconcerting to her passengers. In 1923, British railways were consolidated, and she found herself transferred to Southern Railway, the amalgamation of several smaller companies. In 1933, she was sold to Fernandez Hermanos Incorporated in the Philippines and renamed the SS Corregidor. For the next eight years, the Corregidor served as a luxury inter-island packet. Advertising for her makes particular mention of the air conditioning of her cabins, the excellence of her cuisine, and of her inviting bar. On December 7, 1941, the United States was forced into World War II by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The following day, the Japanese attacked the Philippines, a U.S. territory since 1898, by invading Formosa, modern-day Taiwan, some 200 miles north of the Philippine archipelago, and then heading south through Luzon. On the night of the 16th of December 1941, the Corregidor was in Manila Harbor, overloaded with Filipinos attempting to escape the Japanese advance. It is estimated that between 1,200 and 1,500 passengers were on board, which given the problems the ship experienced as the Engadine when she took aboard 675 crew members from the Warrior, must have posed a serious problem for her stability. At 2200, she left her dock in complete darkness. Now, since July, the entrance to Manila Harbor had been mined. These were electrical in nature and could be switched on or off at need. The captain of the SS Corregidor, one Apollinar Calvo, had had experience negotiating the minefield on several occasions. What happened next is a subject of debate. But what is known for sure is that at 0100 the ship struck a mine and sank within five minutes. An estimated 900 to 1200 people lost their lives. How this happened is a matter of some debate that goes on to this day. One account states that the torpedo boat PT-41 was escorting the Corregidor through the minefield when it unaccountably went off course and hit a mine. PT-41 is, of course, notable for being the craft that rescued General Douglas MacArthur. The first major problem with this story is that while it is generally accepted that PT boats 32, 34 and 35 participated in picking up survivors, there is no mention of PT-41 being involved and it would have been the first on the scene. A second account states that the Corregidor attempted to leave without coordinating with Harbour Defence Command as was usual, and that in the process the minefield was left active. Commensurate with this version is the accusation that the Corregidor was spotted leaving by officers of the Army's Seaward Defence Command post on the island of Corregidor, but that the commander, one Colonel Paul Bunker, refused permission to deactivate the minefield, thus contributing to the ship's demise. Yet another version states that the Corregidor's departure was delayed while submarines were brought in through the minefield. This means she was cooperating with the Harbour Defence's command post. The control ship was about to signal the Corregidor to proceed when she struck a mine in the outer field. This account originates with the memoir of Colonel William C. Braley, then the commanding officer of Harbour Defence's command, he further states the ship proceeded on its own initiative. A final version for the purposes of this recording, but by no means the last one that can be found should you go looking, states that the SS Corregidor was sunk by a Japanese mine laid by the submarine I-124 on December 7th. The I-124 had certainly laid 38 Type 88 mines off Manila Harbor, and one of these is credited with sinking the Panamanian-flagged cargo ship Daylight on January 10th, 1942. And yes, I know that the picture shows the I-121, but it's the same class of submarine. 
This version is regarded by the Internet as being the least plausible. As Captain Calvo died in the sinking, we can never know what happened from that source. Nor was Colonel Bunker available for questioning after the war as he died of starvation and disease in a Japanese prisoner of war camp at Karenko, Taiwan. The incident was never investigated at the time due to the Japanese invasion. But we shall probably never know the whole truth. There were only 275 survivors. The wreck of the Corregidor might have been located in 2011. It lies about 2,000 yards to the southeast of La Manja Island at a depth of 95 feet. It is currently undergoing involuntary dismantling by illegal blast fishing and is under threat from being salvaged piecemeal and its metals sold for scrap.